one more hour left to vote for your favorite health innovation. So where can you vote for it? You can just go ahead and go into your inbox. You must have received yet another email with a subject, vote for the best innovation. And you just pick the one you like the most. If you haven't gotten a chance to, to, to learn more about them, you can go after or during the break uh, to upstairs to the first floor and learn more about it. It is very important that you vote because thanks to your decisions, we will be able to pick a winner today at the closing ceremony. So again, voting closes at 1 p.m. With that said, let us begin. So there is a narrowing window of opportunity to ensure net zero CO2 emissions before 2050. In parallel, the threats from biodiversity laws are just as imminent. And uh, one of those threats is the laws of, or, or actually the creation of new pandemics. Here to elaborate more is Jans Nielsen, founder of the World Climate Foundation. Now the World Climate Foundation is an impact oriented organization that facilitates large scale collaboration between governments, business, financial institutions, and civil society to create resilient markets and solutions for a safe, clean, and zero economy. Net zero, I mean. So Jans, you will actually be joining forces with the Geneva Health Forum on November 2nd to host uh, the Global Biosecurity Summit. Now, I know that your uh, organization is based in Copenhagen, Denmark. So why did you pick Geneva and uh, why now? Well, uh, we acknowledge that uh, Geneva is a host of the World Health Organization. Uh, Geneva is also um, uh, an important place uh, with uh, uh, both the, internet, the whole international Geneva, but also as a cluster uh, or with a pharmaceutical cluster, a strong pharmaceutical cluster and a strong financial cluster. And then uh, why are we partnering uh, directly with the Geneva Health Forum is that it's uh, an established uh, forum uh, in the health sector uh, and um, we'll, we can bring some of the decision makers that, that we want to get in touch with while we can bring uh, more of the other types of decision makers uh, under one health head, looking at bio biosecurity. Now, I know you're very involved as well in COP26. So why are you so interested, or why is your organization so interested in pandemics and in the future of uh, new diseases? Yeah, so um, uh, future pandemics um, and uh, biosecurity, or however you frame that is uh, more and more related also to the effects of climate change and the loss of biodiversity. So there is, uh, I would say, a, a clear substance, a clear uh, um, relationship between these areas. And, um, and then we believe that uh, when you look at the, um, at the climate space, uh, uh, there, there's been a development of a framework, the Paris Agreement, um, where you kind of know where you want to go to. Uh, you also have uh, worked on a number of years in, in getting close to a more science-based uh, um, knowledge about where, you, where we are now and uh, also establishing, uh, I would say, a stronger and stronger institutional framework uh, for reaching the, the goals of the Paris Agreement through public-private collaboration. And uh, we, 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 we think and we hope that uh, some of these mechanisms can also be used uh, under One Health hat to look at uh, pandemic preparedness. Now, is the event that you're organizing in November, is it private, is it public? What's the target audience and what can we expect from it? Um, first of all, it's a public uh, event and um, we, um, we, we try to, to work with uh, the interested and the relevant stakeholders across uh, a lot of uh, areas. So. Uh, I would say the, the, the target audience is, of course, uh, the health sector and under one health head, uh, uh, human health, animal health and environmental health, uh, but also try to, uh, to integrate uh, the financial sector uh, to have a look at the whole risk perspective, uh, to see uh, and to try and uh, engage the stakeholders when you, when you look at, um, at biosecurity on a broader cross-sectoral um, with a broader cross-sexual lens uh, to it. 
Um, and what do, we, what do we want to get out of it? I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an event to launch a network, an ongoing network. Uh, we would like to um, sort of see where is the agenda now? Uh, what do we know currently about the challenges in, uh, in uh, increasing pandemic preparedness and uh, what is out there in terms of solutions? Collect that uh, knowledge into uh, an agenda that can be discussed. Uh, we hope to, to come with uh, some key conclusions, some outcomes that we can communicate to politicians and um, other key decision makers. And then, of course, we also hope to, um, uh, to create some initiatives, some partnerships, because we are talking about a, a, a common problem uh, that needs, uh, you know, uh, the, the participation of a lot of different actors and that they collaborate together. Now, the likelihood of more pandemics coming in the future is high, and today we have a health sector that is very focused on curing people right now, right? More, more so than preventing. So how can we move to the prevention side, especially when these health issues are related to climate change? Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, if you compare to, to climate and um, and also a little bit of biodiversity, for example. Uh, th then I would say um, uh, f some first hypothesis would be to increase the amount of data uh, that, can, that can be commonly available uh, from, from, a, from a, um, uh, a public perspective. Uh, and then through that also increase the understanding of the challenges at hand and also the opportunities uh, that are out there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, uh, likely most of these solutions have to come in partnership between the private and public sector, but also public-public, uh, integrating uh, elements from philanthropy, funding from the private sector, etc. So that whole uh, collaborative um, uh, space is very important to focus on. Yes, and indeed you mentioned something very important. You mentioned data. And as we said in, uh, in one of our interviews in, in the first day, uh, we can't change what we don't measure. So it is important to really know the data out there yeah. to be able to act not only efficiently, but fast, right? Now, you had mentioned to me before that the WHO had known about a potential new pandemic coming ever since 2014, six years before we publicly knew about COVID-19. And yet, we did not act fast enough when the moment arrived. So how can we get faster at, at detecting these dangerous and disruptive pandemics, aside from, from the data, and acting efficiently without creating panic? Uh, I just had a meeting this morning with uh, one of the leading scientists in the field that mentions uh, the four Cs uh, communication, collaboration, cooperation, and capacity building. And, and I would say it, uh, that, that that's probably where, 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 where some of the answers lie. First of all, uh, through communication, making sure that, uh, that especially decision makers um, are more aware of the, the, um, uh, the, the risk and opportunities in managing pandemics, um, the, the collaboration among both the public and private sector, I can say, for example, in, in climate, uh, by far most of the funding for getting to net zero by 2050, as you mentioned, to start with, has to come from the private uh, sector. Unfortunately, governments don't have that much funding in general in the world. Um, uh, so, as an example, that's, that's where you, you, you need cross-sector collaboration. Then you need cooperation to find new solutions, new initiatives. To, um, to focus on, on both uh, technology and innovation, um, policy and frameworks, uh, and, um, and also finance and investments. And, um, and then, of course, uh, capacity building. Uh, so we are, we are ready to move uh, if a new pandemic should occur. All right. And is there any way that we can start creating a specific campaign, awareness campaign? Uh, to the general public about preventive, preventive medicine for future pandemics, uh, maybe starting by political regulations? Um, 
I'm not a, a, an expert in, in that field, but if uh, I would say um, what I can see, for example, again in the climate space is working a lot. If you see the, the main drivers now is, for example, the bottom-up pressure from climate activism uh, is one of the key drivers right now for uh, many decision makers taking uh, climate change more seriously now that they've done uh, maybe in, in the past decade. Um, and then uh, I would say, so, so I would say starting bottom up, um, making aware, we can see the effects of, of better hygiene, washing our hands uh, among, among us as people. Um, uh, I also think there's a scope for improvement among, among bigger organizations that thrive upon the globalization, but also needs to also have become aware now that there are some limitations on how you can act in that very global world. Uh, and that you have to act with care. Uh, and then thirdly, I would say at the political level, uh, making sure that uh, the governments learn from best practice uh, through how we've handled COVID-19. Yes, you mentioned something important, uh, learning from the best practices. Yeah. So how can we learn or, or what uh, were the lessons learned after COVID-19, would you say? Um, I would say that uh, the, the lessons learned is that um, that, uh, um, uh, and again to your question, it, I, it was no surprise that a pandemic could occur, but we, we were caught by surprise. So, so I think uh, building awareness and building the capacity to act fast uh, all throughout uh, the different levels of society, I think that's uh, what we should learn from. And I think that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scope to, to learn from, from all the practices that has been done in different uh, uh, in different countries, different cities, different ways of, of dealing with this. And we, we need a way to really capture that knowledge. So let's get a little bit more specific when we talk about creating awareness. What is the one action that we should start implementing right now um, instead of having it so vague? Because we do talk about, okay, we need to talk about it. We need to create awareness. How, how, what is the most effective action that we should approach? It's a very good, uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. I would say, um, um, I would say ma making sure that we have, um, uh, that we don't lose the momentum uh, in all the good intentions that there are, that we don't become complacent uh, that we make also our governments responsible for for the fact that they need to handle future uh, pandemics, right? Because it's uh, it's uh, it's again it's one health, it's our it's all our health that's at risk with pandemics, and um, and then um, may I come with one more action? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Then I would say from from a, a climate nerd, I would say uh, it's, it's also and it happens. WHO is very active at the, the annual climate cops now. It's very important to to include the health aspects uh, when you deal with climate change, um, when you deal with biodiversity uh, loss. Um, uh, climate change will lead to um, to uh, higher sea levels. That will lead to floodings uh, and the viruses. They, they they go also with the sewage system, etc. Uh, the more we dig into uh, the jungle, the more we we um, we sort of uh, urbanize ourselves. Uh, the the more interaction we'll have with animals, where where a lot of uh, the, uh, the viruses appears. Now, is there anything that I'm forgetting here? Should, do you want to add anything else as we wrap up this interview? Um, yeah, I welcome everybody to, um, to uh, engage uh, with us, uh, take uh, contact to uh, the World Climate Foundation or Geneva uh, Health Forum. There's information on our websites. Uh, so this is a, a collaborative um, effort uh, and, and welcome everybody to, to get in touch. And right. participate. So, in this very last question: How can people here register for the Global uh, Biosecurity Summit? Uh, who can they expect to see there? Any any interesting personalities? 
Um, yeah, we will uh, try and, um, and and get some of the, 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 the I would say the leading scientists, uh, the leading decision makers, uh, some of those that, uh, that that really have had had made an impact um, during COVID-19. That also have some some thoughts and some of the long-term perspectives uh, looking ahead, and also uh, so, so so that's uh, the, the 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 people you would meet. But but I would say is. Uh, we're also focusing on, on the whole network and, um, and uh, making sure that everybody gets something out of, uh, out of the network and the forum. Uh, so, so there'll be a lot of very interesting, everybody's interesting in this uh, space. Um, and um, I don't know if registration is up yet, but uh, it will soon be up to register for the forum. Thank you so much, Jans, for your appreciated insights on the interrelation of pandemics and climate change. Now, if you're watching us online, you can go ahead for a short snack. And if you're here, you can feel free to stretch your legs, go upstairs to the innovation booths and have some lunch. We'll be back at 2 p.m. with much more.